a move, motion by Wright, second by Peterson to adopt the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Up next is general public comment. Now is the time for the members of the public to discuss any or express any concerns on the council, to the council on the issue not on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the council present. I do not have any current speaker request forms for general public comment. Does anybody wish to speak on any items not on the agenda? None appearing, I'm going to move on to consent items numbers 1 through 17. I'm going to open public comment on items 1 through 17. I currently have no speaker request forms on items 1 through 17. Does anybody wish to speak on those items? None appearing, I'm going to close public comment on items 1 through 17. Up, I will now look to the members of the council to see if they want to pull any items, and I go to Charity Doyle. There you go. Items 15 and 16, please. Okay, items number 15 and 16 at the request of Alderman Doyle. Any other? I entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, all I, we've approved the consent items numbers 1 through 16, um, with the exception of 16 and 17. I'll now move to item number 16, which is an update on the CDBG. We have the 15. I'm sorry, 15 and 16, my apologies. And we did approve items 1 through 17, exclusive of 15 and 16, correct? Okay, correction for the record. Okay, item number six, 15, excuse me, is an update on the affordable housing and Rapid City Senior Service Needs of Assessment. And Chair recognizes Barb Garcia, please. Uh, if we could please ask the booth to, I don't have her booth, her. Okay, mine's on. It was him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the mayor had asked me to come before you and give you an update on where we are with affordable housing and the senior needs survey in light of a lot of activities that are going on with collaborative groups. Um, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there have been a lot of um, things going on in our community lately, and so I wanted to give you an update on where we are and some of the things we're moving forward with. Uh, in light of the comprehensive plan that's being adopted, recently you adopted our five-year comprehensive plan or consolidated plan for CWG, and the comprehensive plan includes a lot of the goals and priorities that we had and the for both the senior s survey and this you have to forgive me i ran <laughs> so it's taking me a minute to get my breath back um, in the affordable housing one of the first things that has to be done for everybody to be on the same page is having some definitions that we can go by that's been something that's confused a lot of the community and so what we operate under for our uh, cdbg funds and our other federal guidelines are HUD's low income definition. And that means anybody making less than 80% of the area median income. And for a family of four, it's by family size. So if it's one person versus four people, a family of four runs in the neighborhood of $45,000. So if you're under that, you're considered low income under our CDBG guidelines. So, the other definition is affordable housing. Everybody talks about oh, what's affordable. Well, we target housing to different income levels. And that can be low-income people in particular. That's what CDBG requires us to target. And for low-income, that meets the top definition of 80% of median or less. And we have low, very low, and extremely low as the three categories. 30% of median, 50% of median, and 80%. Anything over that. Now, South Dakota Housing, everybody knows that they, we have low income loans through South Dakota Housing's first time home buyer program. They will go up to 115% of area median. So this is where all the confusion starts happening for people in the community about what it is. And it depends on the funding source, what target income we're going for. As far as affordable housing, HUD is very firm about 
your house payment plus utilities is less than 30% of your gross income. That would be deemed affordable. You're paying about one third of your income for housing, one third for food, and one third for everything else. This is kind of what they look at. So affordable housing can mean people not just in the low income categories. Affordable housing can apply to anybody. It's based on what your gross income is, paying 30% of that. And that's where the workforce housing definition comes in. A lot of people like to refer to workforce housing because it doesn't have the negative connotation that low income housing does. Workforce housing though, from my standpoint at CWG is, you could be talking about a group of people I can't fund because they are middle income and upper income. Workforce is anybody holding a job, having a salary, who's paying for their housing. And in our communities, in Rapid City and surrounding, there is an issue of workforce affordable housing, even at middle income and upper income areas. If you look in our consolidated plan, some of the highest, um, the highest numbers of people who are uh, having problems with house payments are people in the upper income areas. If you look on the maps, they targeted Carriage Hills and some of the more expensive developments in town as having cost burdens paying more than 30% of their income. Many of them choose to do that. So they've chosen that path. Those in the low income ranges don't have much of a choice. The rents are set at what they are and their incomes, they're cost burdened out of the chute because of the low wages that we have, especially on minimum wage jobs. So when we're talking about housing and anything to do with it, you have to understand these definitions to know what somebody is talking about and who they are targeting with their project. There are a lot of different types of housing stock needs. Typically, we only think about home ownership and rentals when we talk about housing. But in housing, there's a number of different types. Warming beds. Um, you often hear there are projects that we're trying to get going that will target the chronic inebriates who are not eligible to go to the mission. If you're actively drinking or using drugs, you're not allowed into the mission due to safety reasons, not because they have anything against them, but it creates a safety problem for the rest of the people at the mission. So warming beds are one of the high priority needs that we have identified in the community. Emergency shelters, meaning a place where people can stay for a short period of time. It's not meant to be a long-term housing arrangement. When they move into the mission, they're supposed to be there for a couple of weeks and then be able to transition out into other housing. Transitional housing is housing that is provided for a short-term period of time, usually not more than 18 months. That gives people a chance to get employment, get on their feet, they have a place to live, and then eventually they will transition out of that into what we call permanent housing, meaning a regular rental or home ownership. Single family home ownership, multifamily rental apartments, those are the two things we think of the most when we talk about housing. But then there's also a lot of special needs housing. Now, special needs can translate across any of those groups because for special needs, we're talking about people who need handicap accessibility, who have, um, maybe they need supportive services, uh, those with developmental disabilities, those with um, physical disabilities. It can be people who need a short-term chronic, uh, such as detox. It can be somebody going through chemical dependency treatments. There's all those different kinds. Then on top of that, you add senior housing and you take with seniors, you then have various transitions of they live in their own home until they can't, then they move into a senior uh, development, then they need some supportive services, so they move into assisted living. From there, they may have to go into rehab housing for a longer period of time or into a nursing home. So you can see that when we talk about housing, there's a multitude, a pyramid, there's a pyramid, and there are a lot of layers to that pyramid, and then a lot of different services are needed to go with it. So as we go into developing our, our projects as we go forward, 
we're trying to look at all of those and see where our gaps are and try to figure out how to fill those. In the community right now, I have a, co a collaborative group being led by the John T. Vakurvich Foundation. Sandy Deagle is the coordinator of this um, affordable housing collaborative group who are trying to come together to really address um, United Way, John T. Vakurvich Foundation, um, the city are all participating as main funders of housing projects in our area to try to coordinate our efforts and leverage our dollars to accomplish some of the big holes we have in our housing. And that collaborative group is just getting off on our feet right now. In conjunction with it, running at the same time, is a um, poverty to prosperity initiative to where we look at the issues of uh, those who are living in poverty in our community and try to figure out how to help lift them out of it, not just keep providing services that keep them there but try to come up with the, the net that pulls them up out of the water instead of just keeping them from sinking. So we have two major collaborative efforts going on right now. Um, at the same time, we're finishing our city comprehensive plan of which many of these goals are set in there and they're set in our consolidated plan for the block grant funds. So we're trying to get them all together around one table so we aren't um, addressing these separately without discussion. So that's part of why I'm, I'm here today is to kind of touch on some of these um, efforts and movements that we have going. I've already gone through the, the types of housing that we talked about. Now these are the high priority goals already identified in the consolidated plan, which the city has adopted and which we are obligated to address using our block grant funds going forward. And the highest priority ones, of course we have usually probably on the order of 30 high priority issues identified in that plan. What we're trying to do now is narrow that down to the ones that we are actually going to try to address first. Um, and, and in my, the second half of this presentation, there'll be some recommendations on changes to our, how we handle our block grant funds so that we can better do this. One of the top holes we have in housing right now are single resident occupancy apartments. And what this is, is apartments, an efficiency or a one bedroom for a single person or a couple. We have a big hole for them right now and they make up over half of our homeless because a single person cannot afford a one bedroom apartment um, on their own, especially if they have a minimum wage job. Even if they held two minimum wage jobs, they cannot afford a single a one room apartment in our community. Um, they need to have two and a half jobs to come close. They will not qualify, um, well let me rephrase that so that Doug Wells doesn't come after me. They qualify for Section 8 vouchers under Pennington County Housing. However, there are preferences given to families and veterans. So the likelihood of someone without children rising to the top of the two, over two year waiting list are zero unless they're a senior to go into the senior apartments and there's over a year waiting list for those. Um, they aren't going to make it. So that is our biggest hole right now is trying to find affordable, meaning in that $350 to $500 range for an apartment. So single resident occupancy is our, our number one. Emergency shelter apartments for families. Right now the way the mission is set up, they have the men's mission and they have the women and children. If a woman has a 12-year-old son and little girl, she and the little girl can go to the women's mission, but the boy cannot. The boy would have to go to the men's mission, which is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, and Cornerstone knows that. Um, so what they need are apartments where a family unit, and if it was a father and a son and a mom and a daughter, the women would be split from the men and they would have to go to the men's mission. And it's still not ideal that any young boy be at the mission. There's just too many opportunities for um, somebody to prey on a, a young boy. So uh, we're trying to create apartments for families where the family unit can stay together at a time that is the hardest on their relationship. So. Um, of shelter apartments for youth. We have a very large population of youth 
who are um, on the streets or couch surfing. And they stay really far below the radar because if, uh, if people find out, then they could get put in foster homes. They may have had bad, you know, bad experiences in foster homes before. So they don't like to come forward. It's very difficult to actually work with them um, in getting them into safe housing because of some of the other issues of guardianship and parental rights and, and all. So, but it's a population that is over 40 or 50 kids. That's the ones that we really know about. So um, substandard housing continues to be a big issue. Uh, that the few apartments that might be in the affordable range, meaning 350, 400, 500 dollars, um, are often substandard without some of the services, in very poor condition, have mold, mildew, um, all sorts of problems with them. So we, we really need to look at addressing substandard housing. Uh, as a city, under our block grant funds, we are supposed to really be pushing Energy Star and green building, uh, as in ways of reducing the utilities that affect the low-income people who are living in the housing. Under public facilities, specific top priority goals um, that we should go, there's a number of them. Uh, anything to do with public facilities, fixing them up, remodeling, rehab, um, is eligible. But we should really, in my opinion, and my recommendation, is that we should focus in on handicap accessibility so that in all public facilities, people with handicaps have the ability to go and enjoy the services provided there. Safety issues, such as fire suppression, um, and any other types of safety corrections that need to be done to the building, uh, whether it's electrical or plumbing, um, energy efficiency, any way that we can reduce the cost of utilities in the public facilities is a benefit to us as a community as a whole, because that means more of their dollars are going to their services than their overhead. Public services, right now, um, the way we do our, our grant offerings is anybody can apply for anything that's eligible. Um, it has to meet one of our high priority needs and as I said, we've got a lot of high priority needs identified in our plan. Um, the city also has what used to be called the subsidy dollars, which is now called investment dollars, um, from the general funds that are split between allied arts and the human services. Under CDBG, we also fund those human services, and often we are funding the same agency, maybe for two different programs, maybe for the same program under the two, because it, in years past, they weren't looked at together. Um, and in the past couple of years, I've sat on that other general funds uh, committee so that now we have a better idea of which ones are being funded where but that has not eliminated the fact that we may fund them under CDBG and subsidy dollars both. Uh, my opinion is we shouldn't duplicate them anymore. We should, we should really look at where we can best use the two different types of funding sources. Um, focused, I think that the focus of the public service dollars going forward in both accounts need to be on supportive services for the collaborative projects those projects that are really going to make the biggest impact. And if we focus all of our dollars from all of the sources in on those, we, we will actually be able to see results instead of them being diluted. Um, and we need to focus on the highest priority needs, take that list that we have of many, and narrow it down to the top three or four uh, in, that pro in that category. Recommended changes. Um, I've had several discussions with the mayor uh, about, um, I think that we need to make some changes to our CDBG program. We already have policies and procedures in, in effect that the council has approved. So to make any changes, they need council approval to change those. So um, what I wanted to do is bring forward some of those recommendations and, and get your approval on them. Recommendation one is that the city should choose a couple of those most important priorities to focus in on, um, looking at the city's comprehensive plan, the senior study, the consolidated plan, and deciding which ones should we really address 
uh, of those. They're all needed. They're all needed. They're all very important. But we're as funding is going down, um, as funding gets tighter, uh, it's. And our funds are diluted out. Uh, for instance, in an average year, we're usually funding anywhere from 15 to 21 projects with our CDBG dollars. Uh, if we funded only five or six projects, each project would get a lot more money, which means they can make a, a lot larger strides towards meeting the goal of that project. And. Um, I think that's where the combination of United Way, Vakurvich, and the city's block grant funds, if we're all working together to figure out who can fund which uh, with their funds that make more sense and we can put larger dollar amounts towards them, we'll actually accomplish some of these. Those uh, goals and the priority needs that I had outlined on the last slide have been on our books since 1976 as unmet not even addressed, single resident occupancy. Um, nothing has been done towards them since 1976, and yet they've been in the top five priorities of the city for years, but nobody stepped forward to do them. So that's why I'm saying that I think we need to identify those as a city and then target our RFPs that way. Right now we put it out and say the city has $455,000, um, submit has to meet a high priority need and address low income needs. And that's all it says of all of the needs. I would like to say we have dollars to give for an SRO for a single resident occupancy apartment building. Who wants to apply? Who wants to do the project? Because if we wait for somebody else, it's not going to happen. Um, so that's one of my recommendations is that we get more focused on how our RFPs are put out to target specific goals that we set. Recommendation two is to revamp the subsidy committee, as we used to call it. It's now called investment committee. Um, one of the recommendations would be to take it out of the political ring uh, for two reasons. Number one is the re-elections every year and having to educate over and over on what is and isn't eligible and how it works. And number two, um, it gives us that longevity and it takes it out of having to be a political decision. Uh, the, my recommendation would be that they are appointed, maybe five with two alternate people appointed from the community who are well versed in what the needs um, and how the nonprofits work and what the, the criteria are. Uh, this committee would oversee CDBG and make the decisions. We would implement a scoring uh, point system for applications for them to review that target our specific goals. The committee would also oversee the human services dollars of investment committee, the general dollars, the general fund dollars. And it would also then become the operating board for the strengthening families platform to provide long-term stability and keep them moving forward. Right now, I am that steering person, and I'm spread pretty thin, and if I'm not able to be there, nothing happens, frankly. It has stopped in the last year when I had to pull back because of staffing issues and address only our grant. Um, everything has come to a stop with it, and that's why Sandy stepped up to do the collaborative affordable housing to keep that moving when I can't be there. So this would provide the oversight of three very important things that are all working together and it would give that insight because it would be people who have the um, you know the 30,000 foot view shall we say of all of those projects the recommendations still come to council council still has final decision on how the funding is awarded but they would be making the recommendations right now the way those that committee is set up is it's the President and Vice President of the Council, um, City Finance Officer, uh, United Way Director, um, you know, and City Staff. So it's not the community really having the input. And with block grant funds, and especially, we're supposed to have full community input on, on what we do. Recommendation three would be to promote a permanent affordability of properties with our CDBG dollars. 
Um, right now, if CDBG dollars are used to help somebody purchase a home with assistance money through one of the nonprofit housing agencies, um, they may be getting $10,000 towards their down payment and closing costs. When they sell that house, they're recovering. You know, we recover up to 10 years or 30 years on that. They recover the 10,000. But they're getting all the appreciation. They're, they're getting everything. And at the second seller, the new buyer for that house, that house is now in a different price range because of that appreciation. So with the funding that where we're putting large dollar amounts, I'm not talking about the $5,000 or something, but if we're giving them the amount for the lot cost um, to use for assistance, it would be my recommendation that we require them to put that property in the Dakota Land Trust to maintain that affordability for that income bracket person for the next 200 years. It would stay in the same income bracket um, because of the way that the land trust is set up. And it would be a better way to ensure that we always have low income housing in the areas of town that we need them to be in. And that's all over town. There needs to be low income housing all over town, wherever there are jobs and wherever people want to, to live. That is part of what HUD tasks us with seeing that we're doing. Recommendation four would be that if you're going to be providing TIFs for housing projects, make it contingent on the developers assisting in some way the development of affordable housing for low income people. Whether that is setting aside several of the lots within that new development for affordable housing, whether it's discounting the lots to make them affordable for low income, whether it's if they don't want low income housing in that particular development, maybe contributing dollars into a, a pool of funds that can be used for development of affordable housing. This is being done in many, many other states and communities around the country that if they're using TIFs for housing projects, they're making them contingent to where the city gets something in return for that TIF that helps incentivize doing low-income housing. Um, because frankly, for a developer, there's not much money in doing it. So that's why they don't. So unless we can incentivize in some way, um, them doing it, and a TIF is a big incentive. If they want the TIF, then they should have to give up something to help with the affordable housing. Recommendation five, create a low interest revolving loan fund to assist low income homeowners with sidewalk repairs, tree removal, those things that are not eligible under HUD dollars. Uh, because that's a big issue in our community. The sidewalk issues have become a really big issue that you want them addressed. However, people don't have the money and they don't have access to credit many times to be able to spend $1,200 on replacement of a sidewalk. Um, setting aside a, a, a group of, or a pool of money that could be used as a revolving loan fund. Um, an example is many years ago, the city set aside money for the rehab program that, that I run for the city uh, for owner occupied rehab. We haven't had to take dollars from the grant itself Probably, I think we used some in two of the years of the 10 I've been here. The fund is paying for itself in the payments that people make back because we provide some of them at 3% or the others are at 0% where they don't make a monthly payment, but they are selling their house and they're refining it eventually and, and we're getting money back. Um, we got to probably at least 15,000 back this year from repayments of loans, not counting their regular monthly payments. That was just lump sum payments of, of loans. So we haven't had to go back to the till to get money to do those projects. Um, we're getting very low in the fund right now uh, because we've been doing a lot, we did you know, a lot of rehab here recently. So uh, a revolving loan fund needs one infusion of money we give out the loans, people make the payments back, and we then reloan that money. 
if you really want to be able to address some of these kind of bigger ticket items that people can't do, but they make a big difference in the way the community looks and um, the, you know, the beautification of our community and neighborhoods, this is one thing that would definitely help. And it's not that hard to do. Um, recommendation six is Occasionally there are opportunities um, for borrowing or getting grants, uh, funds that would help with housing projects or other types of projects in our community. And we haven't done it in the past, but uh, there is an opportunity with a couple of funds that the city could access. Um, usually we prefer to have nonprofits doing that accessing the funds and using them themselves but a couple of times there have been occasions where it would be beneficial if the city applied we were approached not too long ago in regards to the new south dakota housing opportunity funds that's the sort of a trust fund that was set up to provide ongoing that pool of funds a revolving fund to to give out to the communities and yes, um, in that particular case, a nonprofit asked if the city would apply. And I asked them why they wouldn't apply. I thought that nonprofits were eligible, and they said, yes, we are. In this particular case, it's an underwriting issue with banks that if the city, a government agency, applies for the funds, they can be considered, and we provide them, say, 5000 towards their closing costs. It can be considered their money for qualifying for their investment, their minimum investment by the bank. If a nonprofit provides it to them, it cannot be considered as their money. They still have to save their percentage of money, which means it'll be that much longer before they can afford to get into a house. So in that particular case where somebody needs some help in getting the funds accumulated, um, if the city applied for them, that would help move the process by probably three to five years for that person to access housing. And in many cases, the housing home ownership costs them less than rental <laughs> does with the way the interest rates are. Section 108 funds is a loan from HUD using the block grant funds as the collateral. We're allowed to, to um, borrow up to five times our grant allowance. So that'd be in the neighborhood of two and a half million that the city could use towards housing or economic development project. Um, those we wouldn't apply for until we actually had a, a project ready to go that the city would look at doing that. Um, but those are some considerations for you that we have the opportunities to do this if council were, were to okay that. The senior study um, had some recommendations in their plan, and people have wondered, well, are, what are we doing? Are we moving forward with it? And I will say I have not had the time to devote to specifically going after this plan yet. However, I did a quick review of what they asked for and compared it with what we already have going or can easily get going. And so. Um, one of the first things they said was make a plan and incorporate the and promote neighborhoods development and making them close to retail and businesses including multi-generational housing and zoning opportunities all of those things well they are in the new comprehensive plan so they've been adopted the, the zoning and the to, to make it possible and for the emphasis to put housing uh, closer to the shopping and try to reintegrate that that's that's already moving forward improve sidewalks crossing streets for use by senior citizens enforcement of handicapped zones um, improving of the sidewalks again that goes back to the discussion we had can code enforcement go after sidewalks yes can the people afford to fix them no so then the city will lay out the money and we'll have to wait to get it back um, it's in how you want to do it be give them the opportunity to pay for it themselves by providing the revolving loan that's an option um, many of these issues about the crossings and updating it are already in public works plan and in uh, the comprehensive plan also the indoor recreation centers 
um, creation of the one-stop center, uh, better availability of the physicians. Those, all of these are some of the things that they had asked for uh, besides what is up at the top. Improving information sharing about assistance. We have the 211 program. Um, we have a lot of these programs already in place. Neighborhood development, um, new development and affordable housing are too far from the grocery stores, retail outlets for people with limited transportation. Um, another comment of theirs was that it's too expensive for seniors to ride the bus. Well, I looked down through Rapid Ride's website and yes, they're not available to all areas of town yet. Um, the buses don't run on Sundays or after five. These were some of their biggest issues with it. Fixed stops that require walking distance in the elderly uh, for the weather and not close to it. However, rapid ride, you know, they, they have rapid ride and then um, they do have door pickup for those with a disability, but it's not for someone who doesn't have a disability. They do have lowered fares for honored citizens. I didn't even know this until I looked. Uh, and it's half the price, it's 75 cents, for people 60 years or older, disabled, or with Medicare card. So the fares are already reduced for those who are considered their honored citizens. And I don't think that the general public knows that. I mean, I sit there in the bus station and I deal with them all the time and I talk to people and we give out bus passes, but I didn't know that particular point either. So, um, I think we could do a lot more in getting the word out to the community. Uh, their rides, they've put more stops in. They run um, instead of every hour, it's every 30 minutes now. They have changed a lot about how they're, they're running. And I just don't think that the general public realizes it. So we just need to do more work there. Accessing affordable health care, including geriatric specialists. I looked. Uh, in the phone book, there are six geriatric specialists in town. They may not be in the specialties that these people want. I don't know. Again, I think that's something that we could do more work with the hospital. Uh, they talked about recruiting more people here. Well, that really needs to come from the medical community. But maybe that's a discussion that we have to make them aware of what's in the senior plan um, so that they can move forward with more care. Mental health care resources, um, out of the 39 mental health, only two offer inpatient services. That is a big hole in our services in this area that, that for treatment people have to leave our area, uh, both for that and for uh, substance abuse treatments. And so, you know, that's part of our problem. But we now have the Black Hills Collaborative um, they're moving forward with new projects all the time. They've identified these issues and are working through their plan. So there is progress moving forward on it. Fitness opportunities. They said there wasn't enough for seniors and that there's very few programming uh, for seniors specifically. However, when I looked, I went on the website again for the city and they actually have a number of programs for seniors, but I don't think they recognize the name of the programs because it was Silver Sneakers. And <laughs> so they probably didn't associate that, but the city recreation program has um, swimming and lap times at all of their things, water, physical. They have the Rusty Hinges, the Silver Splash, flexibility and cardiovascular. Um, Pilates stretch, arthritis class, the aqua power, <coughs> which also is exercising for seniors, and aerobics. Land physicals, um, they have muscle pump, Pilates, silver sneakers, classics, cardio fit, yoga, and tai chi that are all there that are aimed towards seniors. Um, other workout centers are the Canyon Lake Seniors and Menaluzahan, YMCA, and other private gyms uh, around town. Some of those services get diluted for the seniors, especially those who are wanting the very low cost uh, because we do have two senior centers. So funding is spread between two of them, which means you can spend less on the programs in each one of them. 
so a combination of them, I, although not popular among the two sides, uh, is still something that would definitely affect that. The, there are no indoor city tracks. However, there are city indoor tracks, or there are indoor tracks at Central High School's new building and the YMCA. One other thing that maybe they don't know is that the purchase of a senior pass at the city recreation facility allows free participation in their activities. I think many of the seniors think that it costs them more at the city recreation. So again, I think we need to do more about getting the word out about exactly what our program is. Um, and we can also, they wanted more, more of the programs available in their neighborhoods. I think maybe if we worked with the YMCA, they put youth programs in specific neighborhoods or facilities in neighborhoods. They might be willing to do some adult classes in those na same neighborhoods instead of just concentrating on the youth. So those are a couple more of the activities that we could do to help push that along. The other things they identified, housing, not convenient to the shopping and their services, independent living issues, access to services, transportation and mobility, all of those are being addressed in the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan has specific goals and they're assigned to certain people who are, and we will be responsible for reporting back on the progress. So it's very specific and they've set timelines. That's something I haven't seen before. So um, we have a great possibility. And then the last part of this has to do with, we were just notified of our new funding for uh, this year. And I'm going to have to have to admit I don't come here much. Thank you <laughs> to make it scroll here. Um, the funding that we received this year, um, I overestimated slightly. Uh, I try to get close. I have to guess how much will they take away from us each year. And of course, they're always saying they're going to shut down the program totally. So it makes it kind of hard to figure out where we might fall. Um, I had guessed that we would get 450000 this year. It actually came in at 443, if I could only read how small this print is. Uh, $443,111 is what we actually got instead of 450. So we had to make some adjustments of $6,889. So I took it back to the investment committee with some um, recommendations on what we did. Administration is under a cap. We don't have a choice in that. Um, we cannot spend over 20% of the allocated amount plus our current year uh, program income that we get. So we had to reduce our what we expect for program administration from 90,800 to 89,422. So that was 1378 of the adjustment that was needed. The second part is public services. That is also under a cap. We have no choice in that. We cannot spend over 15% of our funding um, plus the previous year's program income. So it worked out that we had to reduce them by 1,033. So the recommendation was that we take it from behavior management services who were funded for the highest amount of dollars. And um, that's what the uh, investment committee agreed on. So we took it away from them. The remaining adjustment then needed to come off of housing and public facilities. And that was $4,478 needed to be removed from one of the projects that we funded. My recommendation was that we take it from the city's contingency fund for housing projects like our rehab program or if someone else came forward with a housing project. And we had awarded them 22,940. We reduced it by the 4478. And that brought us into um, compliance with our, our grant. So I just need your acknowledgement of the changes to the city annual action plan. 
and Chair then we can do contracts. Chair recognizes Alderman Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to acknowledge, and if I may, retain the floor. By all means. Thank you. A uh, question for Barb Garcia, if I may. I just want to make sure that this acknowledgement is not um, advising or directing staff to pursue these additional funding options. No. Okay. It's just for the annual plan. That's why I worded it that way. I just need your acknowledgement for the uh, amendment to the annual action plan. That's just these numbers right here. Thank you. And then with one question with respect to the section, section 108 funding. Mm -hmm. um, where would the repayment for that loan come out of? I mean, would that be a general fund expenditure, or would it come no. from repayments, or where would where would that repayment for the loan come from? Typically, that comes from the project itself. So if we funded XYZ to do a housing project, they're using it to do the construction, probably, and the infrastructure costs for doing the housing. Um, and then when they sell the houses, the funds that come back into them would make their payments. It's a 20 year, for the city, we have to pay it back within 20 years. So whatever we would do for a project has to be able to pay us back within the 20 years and preferably shorter time frame uh, so that we could pay HUD back. Our loan to HUD goes back within 20 years. All right, thank you very much. Just a point of order, uh, Alderman Doyle. Your motion is just on number, item number 15, correct? Because <clears throat> otherwise we you're got, We got both of them at the same time, but I will break it up to just item 15. Then. It was the second one, I think, for the funding of annual action plan. So uh, my question is, are you, are you, are you, going, are you making a motion to approve the requested changes in policy? I was or making a motion to acknowledge Number 15? Yes. Okay, so the motion is to acknowledge number 15. <coughs> okay, let's get a seconder. Okay, any further discussion on item number 15? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item number 16 is the update on the CBG F of fiscal year 2014. Am I doing correct? Am I correct on this, Joel? And, and my, my order? Okay, you're just looking at me funny, so I'll make sure. It's, okay. Um, funding and approve the requested CDBG policy changes for fiscal year 2015. We have a motion to approve by Peterson and seconded by Doyle, and the chair recognizes Jerry Wright. For clarification, what are the recommendations that you made one through six? Where do they fit into this? Those were the... The goals and planning? Yes, the plan, the changing the investment committee, um, the RFPs, focusing on the high priorities. Those were the ones I was talking about. Okay, I guess I was questioning about the, um, the one about the Dakota Land Trust and the TIF. That's those are part of that. Are, are the actions today approving those, or but they're not, are they? So when will they come back to us, and how do you want to handle that? Well, you can either approve the those recommendations today, as they are, or if you want me to bring them back to you, I can do that. We, I I need uh, the only thing is any changes to the program. Um, I have to put out notices for the RFPs to the community by uh, middle of July. So if we're doing any changes, I would need to come back and have it approved before July so that I can advertise it that way. Okay. The only question, one through six, the only ones I have question in my mind are the, the Dakota Land Trust issue. I'm not clear on that yet. And also the TIF issue. Okay. Uh, otherwise, the other four I could support. So I don't know what the committee would like to do. Is, can we divide, excuse me, Joel and Dean, can we divide that question as approved certain, like one through four and not in certain parts of policy, or how can we do that? Can we dispose them that way? Continue. Can we just continue it? It would probably be best just to continue it rather than try to piecemeal the policy. Okay. Okay. Appreciate okay. that. Okay. I will withdraw my second, so. Okay, so. The second has been withdrawn. Would you like to alter your? Would you like to change your motion? Um, <clears throat> for number 16, my motion would be to approve the update on the CDBG funding for fiscal year 2014 and ask that 
the requested policy, CDBG policy changes for fiscal year 2015 uh, come back to us in two weeks, a month, two weeks? Whenever time. Hmm. Okay. Um, in 30 days and that um, Barb Garcia does, does some um, probably more information on the TIF and um, the Dakota Land Trust and rationale and all for that. Do we have a second? We have a second by Mr. Wright. Motion by Peterson. Any further discussion? We'll go to Charity Doyle. If you wish to speak, or just thank you. Okay. Any, for, any further discussion, Bonnie? I will tell my uh, colleagues, and well, first, Barb, thank you so much. Um, I've been involved in this probably um, for three years, well, not some, this year, but as vice president and president, and these are definite steps that we need to take uh, to make sustainable, to make it sustainable. When you look at um, our, po our uh, low income people and the baby boomers retiring out, we're gonna have a lot of single adults that are only getting $800 a month from Social Security. And you cannot pay five, $600 for an apartment to live if you're only bringing in $800. And so it's a huge issue that's gonna, um, it's already a huge issue, but it's gonna really explode um, as us boomers retire. So thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Does anybody understand the motion? We've divided, essentially divided that motion into two pieces, approving the updated, the fund, the updated funding and bringing back the second part for further study discussion in 30 days. Does that sound correct, Maggie? Thank you. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Up next we have um, uh, public comment on items numbers 18 through 23, non-consent items. I have one speaker request form. I'm now going to open public comment on that item. It's for Raina, is that correct? Yeah. Rana, excuse me, Rana Graham. If you step to the podium, ma'am, you have three minutes. I'll turn the timer and the green light goes on. Oh, it is her item. I apologize. So do you want to speak now or do you want to wait till the end? Um, this, item, this item will come up in a couple minutes here. We'll, we'll, prove it. we'll move the next item and then okay. you can speak then or you can speak now if you wish. No, go ahead. Okay, good. so you can just... Hang tight for a second. Okay. And we'll, we'll go to item number. Any, any further speaker request forms for items 18 through 23? I have none, so I'm going to close public comment on those items and move to item number 18 real quick, which is a report on the All Nighter Softball Tournament and a request to approve the tournament be held June 13th and 14th, 2014. Move to approve. Motion approved by Laurenti, second by Peterson. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Report? Just what was linked. What was linked okay. in the report? Okay, now, ma'am. Sorry, Rana. We're going to your item. Item number 19 is uh, the Rana Graham City Roofing Permit Process and Inspection Concerns. And you do have the floor, ma'am, if you'd like to address the. I just have some concerns since I actually came back to um, the country about three years ago. I purchased a home uh, just under two years ago. And we had several issues with our home to where we contacted the contractor had a lot of problems where he would not come and fix the issues. I contacted the city planning office. They came out, did some inspections, found that the contractor had no permits for certain items, uh, one of those being a deck that he had actually built, which had been passed. And on the first occasion, they then sent him a request to come and fix the deck and also reacquire another permit. Well, the deck collapsed with my husband on it. We could not get the contractor to, to really do anything. He would not issue us with his insurance details. They did come and stabilize the deck. That was it. The city then passed it again to find out on three occasions they passed this deck that had no permit whatsoever. It had a permit for the original deck that was built, but not for the extension part that had collapsed. I ha actually had several members of the city come to my property along with Charity Doyle. Um, that was a gentleman called Brett, I'm not sure of the last names, um, Brad Salon, 
and the inspector who had actually passed it on the other three occasions, which was a gentleman called Mike. I questioned how they passed this, and that was the day I found out that on none of the occasions they actually had a permit. Well, Mike had actually stated in front of all of us that he had passed it because the equipment and the supplies was actually on the ground. I knew it hadn't been built on the day that the, um, they had actually passed it because it was built just the day before I had moved in. So my concern was, and I questioned it, is how they could actually pass something with no permit for one and when the actual item had not been built. He acknowledged his mistake. Brad Salon and Brett actually asked me what I wanted to see as an outcome of this situation and because I had had further issues with this contractor, I said I wanted his license revoked. And they said they were going to do it because I figured if they revoked his license, then he would actually, his, his father who had actually gone into retirement but still kind of sat behind them, would actually come in force and actually fix all the problems we had with our property. Well, they, just before they left my house, they did agree that they were gonna revoke his license. A uh, few weeks passed, I had heard nothing. I contacted Brad Salon to be told all they did was actually fine him. So I left it at that. Um, I've been fixing these issues myself and keeping receipts so that at a later date when I have all the issues fixed, I can actually try to get my money back for the, for the stuff that I've repaired. That was under a warranty that the contractor failed to actually honor. Well, then I had another incident where I actually had a roof installed back in October, um, October the 13th. A contractor sent a crew out to um, fix a roof that had been hail damaged and they were supposed to fix the guttering, replace it all. They came on Sunday the 13th. On the 14th, we, had, we noticed that the, the actual tiles itself were folding up and I contacted this um, contractor, not the owner of the company, but the person who had been dealing with my issues. And he said he was going to send a crew out to repair this stuff. It never happened. So back in January, um, I ended up getting several contractors out to actually do inspections on my roof to see what was wrong with the roof itself and was told I needed a whole new roof and that the actual hail damage item uh, the flashing, the actual starter strips, the guttering hadn't actually been replaced. They were still hail damaged. I contacted the city inspection office again and I spoke to Brad Salon and he said he would make sure someone would come out and they did. But they came out on a day when it was snowing quite heavy and they said they couldn't inspect the roof, which I understood, so they rescheduled. Well, they did issue me with a statement that day that it was an actual inspection where no affidavit had actually been issued. Now, that was fine. They said, you know, the permit had actually expired. He had applied for a permit and it had actually expired after 30 days because he hadn't contacted the city to inspect it or do an affidavit. Well, the two inspectors that came out were a gentleman called Mike and another gentleman called Chuck. I found that Mike was very quiet because he was the one I had a confrontation with about my deck situation. But Chuck, I actually found very rude and arrogant towards myself and the contractors who stepped in to come and speak to them and show them what they found. Um, he, I had told him that day that I had actually received a letter from the owner of the company giving me a week to pay for the roof, which my mortgage company, the escrow account, would not issue because the work had not been completed to a satisfactory manner. I had told Chuck and Mike that day that um, I had issued, uh, that I had been, I had received this letter and that he had threatened to put a lien on my property. And the, the words from Chuck were not our problem, nothing to do with us. That's fine if it's nothing to do with them, but to show a little bit of compassion to the homeowner who's just asking for some advice would be nice. Um, he also stated to me that he used to be a contractor himself and that, excuse my language, that he used to put liens on people to piss them off. 
it cost him $75. It would cost the homeowner $150 to remove this loan, uh, this lien, sorry. And he left my property. He was, well, I should state he wasn't very um, forward to my contractors either that I had come in. So he left and he came, he came back. They came back and inspected my property on the second, the 12th of February, where I had actually told him that I had looked into the lien and that I was given until the 14th of February, sorry, that he could actually put the lien on if I didn't pay him by that date, 15th of February. And so on the 12th of February, I told Chuck that I had contacted the Register of Deeds and they had said that um, they only give you 120 days to put on a lien and Monday would have actually been the expiration date. So I said he can't put a lien on me because he's given me a certain date. Well, Chuck left my house and I have a log which 15 minutes later, Chuck actually contacts this contractor. And on the Monday, the lien was actually put on me. Um, so he actually he put the lien on me several days early. But what I came to find out is that the, he never actually officially had a permit because his permit expired 30 days after for, no, for not giving an affidavit or actually having an inspection done. The city finaled this, um, finaled this roof inspection even though there were issues with the roof. And they never asked him again to come back and fix the issues. And the inspector who actually finaled it is Brad Salon. I'd like to know how this can happen where they keep finalizing these faults with no permits or with the issues actually still against city code and they're finalizing them. It just makes no sense to me. Then for the actual inspector themselves to go back and contact the contractor and tell them a private conversation I had with them, which has now caused me unnecessary grief and a lot of stress is just unbelievable that this could actually take place. Um, I have several reports. The lien, for example, was actually done fraudulently because the owner was actually out of state. And because he had been contacted and told that he had a less period of time to put the lien on, he had his, the lien notarized here in Rapid City where he was actually in another state and it was stamped. I did report this to the police and it was a second class misdemeanor. So I still have a lien on my property which because of the, because of this inspector contacting this contractor and informing him that he only had a certain period of time, I will now in order to get this lien removed have to pay $10,000 to a lawyer to take it to circuit court to get it removed. And again, I just really have issues with the, with the planning office themselves that they, have, they are lacking in professionalism and that they, they actually lack to look at the codes of what they're supposed to honor themselves. Um, that was the other thing. The city inspector, again, Chuck, issued um, this contractor the permit three days after the roof was initially installed. I have a completion certificate which was signed on October the 14th. The roof was installed October the 13th and the, uh, the permit was actually taken out on the 15th of October. They then actually contacted the contractor asking for an affidavit. They have now received an affidavit which I believe they received three weeks ago but with no pictures. Again, they've passed this, um, this roof, even though there's issues, and it's against city code, the city code itself. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure I would recognize Bonnie Peterson. Thank you. Um, also, I just want to say sorry for your issues. I have a question for Joel. By all means. Joel, this sounds like it needs to be investigated, and since it has personnel, potentially personnel issues and all, it seems like um, th 
the best thing for us to do here from the dais is to order some kind of investigation into all of this, but I'm just leery about asking questions and things like that since it involves employees and well, I would seeking some that guidance. Prior to ordering an investigation, I'm guessing that I see Brad's in here. I'm assuming that they have a response they would like to provide to you. Okay, Brad, do you have something you want to say? Brad Slon, if you'd okay. like to approach the uh, podium, sir, and respond. If you identify yourself, please. And please, ma'am, could you please stand by for further questions? <laughs> Thank you. Brad Solwyn from Development Services. Do you have a specific question that you want me to respond to, or what? Well, it seems to me there's several issues here. One is that there's been some lack of thoroughness in the meeting the inspection requirements, uh, whether or not that is because of lack of staff or carelessness, you know, I don't know. It sounds like things were approved without them actually being done. Maybe that's standard practice. Maybe that's sloppy practice. I don't know. Um, my other concern is their rudeness and potential uh, someone um, working outside their scope of their practice of notifying uh, a contractor. Um, I don't know, I just feel a little different about this whole process as opposed to usual problems that we come up with because it seems like there's a lot of personnel issues. But if you... Um, think that the roof was uh, inspected properly by the city, or if you don't, what, what do you, you know, if you want to just talk about the roof inspection. Sure. The city ordinance currently states that uh, for roofing, an affidavit can be filed, so since a lot of roofing gets done on holidays, nights, weekends, whatever. And, so, and it's been that way since the permit requirement for roofing has been in place since 2010. Um, what it is, what the deal is, is that since since roofing gets done on times when we're not at work and we're not open, they can the roofers can file an, uh, an affidavit, and homeowners can file for an affidavit too. The deal with this is, is that the city didn't inspect this because, as as I understand it, both from Rana and from the contractor, this was roofed on a Sunday. The and it's true as we follow up with roofing permits, the contractor was notified uh, of a list of of permits that were done that didn't have an affidavit. This was one of them. The affidavit was provided. And then, then so when we finaled the permit, and I did it because I, I saw the affidavit and I called the contractor and talked to him about it, um, I finaled the permit because that's, that's my job. The affidavit from the contractor is, what's, is the inspection. It's, it's, it's proof from the contractor and a statement from the contractor that the roof was done correctly. The city didn't inspect the roofing, if that answers your question. So you're saying then the affidavit is the contract that no matter what the affidavit would say, the city would take its word for it without doing an additional inspection. Correct. Or an act, you know, or an actual. We're, we're relying on the contractor or the person who, who completed the affidavit and signed it saying, they're saying they did the roof correctly. And when you finalized that, were you aware that there was uh, this roof issue was being a contested or a problem? Uh, at the time, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I know that, I know now that there's been some kind of a lawsuit or a, a, and a lien. Yeah, I do now. Okay. Um, I will leave it up to my colleagues. I'm kind of at a loss about uh, what we need to do with this, except that I do think we need to look f further into uh, some of these allegations about our staff. Thank you. Chair recognizes Charity Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question for Brad Salon, if I may. Multiple questions, actually. Okay. Um, you know, I am having flashbacks to a discussion on the new um, roofing permitting process that we established, 2010-2011, somewhere in that time frame. 
And I remember early on in, in my tenure, um, we brought that forward to find out how that was working. We heard from a n number of roofers that liked the process, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if I'm not starting to see why, because my, my question for you is this, Mr. Solon, if we're licensing these contractors and they're the ones that get to tell us they're doing a good job, then they should just be licensing themselves. I mean, what, what, what are we doing to really police that to make sure that, you know, again, the public expects, we've talked about this in your <coughs> office, when an inspection is done, I've, I've asked numerous people since then just, what is your expectation? Well, I expect that if the city signs off on this, my roof was done correctly or the work or whatever it was. And I agree with that. I think that's an easy, um, an easy thing to expect. So if we're licensing them, but we're not actually inspecting the work, what kind of mechanism is in place for us to know that these licenses are, uh, you know, in the public's best interest or not? What we do when we take an affidavit and know the signature from the contractor, as far as we're concerned, is what is required and what is necessary to have them state that they did the roofing correctly. But what we have been doing is requiring pictures along with the, with the, uh, with the roofing. Um, the city ordinance doesn't say, though, that we have to have the picture, have to have pictures of the ice shield and the tear off and the, you know, all that that you can't see after you roof it. Um, so we we've been requiring those. So we get we get pictures, and so that's how we we try to determine that it's okay. We on numerous occasions with affidavits, we get the pictures either the pictures of the wrong pictures of uh, uh, the wrong picture of the house, or they did it wrong. Uh, we, we make them fix it because the pictures with the affidavit is what we've been using as a tool to say, okay, you did it right or you didn't do it right, or this is the right house or this isn't the right house. Um, so about one-seventh of all roofing permits so far have been done by an affidavit because roofers work when it's nice. They work on Saturday, Sunday, the holiday, even at night. Um, so not all the time roofs are getting done. We're seeing it. Now, we don't get pictures on all uh, of the affidavits for one because it's not required by city ordinance but sometimes they don't have a picture so we can go up on the roof or look and see that you can you can see the ice shield if it's there or not under the shingles but we don't once again we're the we're the city inspectors we'll be accused of damaging the roof if one were on the roof or if we're lifting up shingles breaking the seals things like that so we have to be careful too when we're on the roof uh, looking for for things that might be wrong with the roof uh, but in this case uh, this is a good example where we got an affidavit. Uh, we're going to rely on the expertise of the contractor for signing the affidavit saying that the roofing was done correctly. Okay. Um, what did the pictures or the photos of this particular roof tell you? Once again, on this one, I didn't get pictures on this one. There were no pictures uh, on this I didn't roof. get any pictures on this one. Uh, the city ordinance doesn't require pictures, but as I understand it, I've talked with, with uh, Bolt companies and I've told them we'd like to see pictures. They're going to get pictures of this and, and submit them to us. Well, if the work's already been done, I imagine that it would require tearing things back to get the appropriate pictures, would it not? We could, we could do that, um, but once again, if, if we do that, it's going to go against what the affidavit says, the contractor saying that they did the roofing right. If we make them rip it off and it's still right, uh, we're looking at trouble. Okay. Well, I'm looking at it from a public protection standpoint, and, you know, again, there's an expectation <clears throat> if the city is inspecting a roof that... I mean, are we doing it from the street? Are we keeping our boots on the ground and, and looking up at the roof? How, how do we get up and actually determine? I mean, all, all I'm hearing is we get an affidavit or we actually go out there if it's not on a weekend and we just look up and it's done. We sign off on it. Actually, what's occurring is if we, we most, like I said, on most of them, we get, we, we get pictures because the contractors are very cooperative and they bring pictures in. If we see the affidavit and see the pictures, we'll sign off on it. If, and we're following up on all roofing permits. And so what we're doing is if, if we don't have one, we could go out onto the roof and get ax to get access to the roof, pull shingles up, look at the ends, see, where the see if there's ice shield under there. I mean, you, you can do that. But okay, just well, by, by looking at the perimeter and just the very edges of the roof, it's pretty tricky to say just, yeah, the roof was done all right or it wasn't done all right. Well, I am definitely not a roofer. And I walked over to that property 
and looked up and the flashing clearly still had hail damage, so it was not replaced. So I'm wondering, you know, I could see that from the street. Um, so what are, I mean, and I, I looked through the, the policies, the things that the inspectors do look for, and that was one of them. So why in this case was that passed without that particular item having been replaced? Well, you'd have to go back to the code and read it first, too, to see if the flashing was required to be replaced. Um, if, if, if the flashing is damaged or rusted or corroded mm -hmm. or whatever, obviously it's supposed to be replaced. Now, they didn't, apparently on this one, they didn't replace the, the flashing on this one. Uh, yeah, I guess we, you could go right up to it and look at the flashing and see if it was damaged or corroded or rusted or whatever and require it. Um, well, I guess my biggest concern at this point from what I'm hearing is that we have, I mean, it sounds like this property owner had been in close communication with the city at multiple points before the permit was finaled or the inspection was finaled. And um, so there, it was brought to the city, your attention, that there were issues, that the work was not done plus uh, some, diff some independent um, analyses of our inspections of that roof, when, at what point would we take into consideration before finaling an, an inspection um, that, that maybe there's some information here that might trump the contractor's wor word or affidavit? When, at what point are we going to um, listen to the property owner and these other inspections and kind of take back, sit back and weigh it and, okay, well, if there is work that still needs to be done, has either been incomplete or not done correctly, because we're the license holder, when will we as the city enforce that and, and, and make sure that those issues get repaired, remedied, so that it can be signed off on in completion? Well, I guess... I mean, is that going to take a policy we could, change? What we, could, we could... I don't know if it's a policy change or we could just... Uh, it, you know, as far as the affidavits go and taking them in and whether we have pictures or not and how we approve them or not, um, I guess we could change the way we do that. Um, you know, there are other options too. You know, if this affidavit thing is a big problem, maybe the consideration needs to be done to take it out. Uh, all I know about that is, is that you, you mentioned it, that there were a number of roofs here the last time that that occurred. I'm pretty sure that if you, if you decide that you're not going to do affidavits anymore, you're going to have an arm, this room would be full of contractors and roofers. Yeah, Mr. Salon, but what I am saying is if we're going to do it, then we need to make sure that we have more than just somebody's signature saying that that work had been properly done because it's, it's to protect the public. That was the whole reason that we changed that process and when we were looking at these roofing permits in the first place, if I recall correctly. It was all from the standpoint of, of protecting the public from a lot of different things, including the predatory roofers and the fly-by-nights and, and things like that. And so I, I think the process, as it was intended, is good and, and solid and it should work. I think this is a case where it's not working. And, you know, I, I am concerned um, as well that work is being completed prior to the issuance of a permit. So can you explain to me how that works? Do we have a certain amount of time that, I mean, contractors can come in and do the work and then apply for a permit after the fact? Are we, and I understand you can't be at every house all the time checking on these things, but what do we do, especially if it's brought to your attention? How do we, how do we remedy that? What we do is is if, if we know that it's been done, we tell the contractor, you, you've failed to get a permit, you have to get a permit, and it's going to be a double fee penalty. That's what it says in the ordinance. That happened in this case? Uh, actually, until, until she said that, uh, I didn't. I have no information that it was done prior to the permit. That's the first time I've heard of that. All I have is I can tell you the day that the permit was applied for, the date that it was approved, and the date that it was issued, and the dates that we were out there. Uh, so till just 15 minutes ago, I didn't know okay, if so the roof had been that? done prior to that, so I can't answer that question. But you will look into that for us. I can look into that, Thank yes. you very much. And then I had one other question. Let me see where I wrote it in my chicken scratch here. Um, I'm not seeing it, Mr. Solon. I will chime back in if I can find it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Joel, did you want to weigh in? You had had your light on, and before I go to, okay, 
Okay, uh, Mr. Wright. This appears to be a very complex issue. It involves, if I understand right, a deck and a roof. So there's two separate items, correct? And involves money, involves employees, involves basically a citizen's entrustment into the city for process and so forth. So I would like to make a recommendation, I can't because I've already spoken, that either our city attorney or our risk management office would, would take statements from all parties involved and come back to us with a recommendation as where the liability and what the issues are and what we could do to rec uh, correct these situations. I don't think we can handle it from this dais today. And I don't think we can, as a committee, without more consistent or more um, detailed information and so forth, would be wise to make a decision. So I, I'm sorry I spoke too soon, but I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to make a motion that we direct the city attorney or risk management office, or as they see appropriate, to take statements and come back to us with a recommendation of course of action. Okay, uh, Mr. Laurenti. I move to uh, have city staff um, gather information on this particular incident with this uh, resident so that uh, they can be um, brought back to the council. And actually, maybe we want to bring it back to legal and finance. Um, Joel, if, you, if I can, Joel, how much time do you need? I mean, is this, it, first let me ask you, I've made the motion, I guess I need a second first, so. Thank you. One, I want to get your opinion, because I'll withdraw it if, if you think there's a better course of action. And then number two, how much time are we gonna need so we can put a, a, a time on that? Well, I'm trying to decide who I'm gonna task to do this. I think I know when they have a few other projects over the next two weeks. So I'd probably ask to come back in a month and update you where we're at. It sounds like there's gonna be, there's a couple issues over a long period of time. There's gonna be records that need to be looked at as well as people that need to be talked to. So I would ask for at least a month. One month? Okay. So one month, I don't know what we're looking at for the specific date, a month from now, the, nec the next legal and finance meeting. Okay, first legal and finance meeting in May. Um, and then if I would, I'd like to maintain the floor. Uh, Brad, if, I, if you can, I have a question for you on this as well. Knowing that I've, I've had a, a roof done myself in the last couple of years, and there were, there were some issues in the, the uh, mine was done during the week, um, the inspection process and, and the signing off uh, on them. Because I, I too, I, I agree with Alderwoman Doyle here. I mean, these processes we put forth, or we put together with staff, are really designed to protect citizens of Rapid City. Um, and I'm concerned because of my own experience and from the uh, testimony, I, I shouldn't call it testimony, but from the words from the uh, citizen here, I, I'm a little concerned and hopefully when we come back with the information, I, I'm hoping we'll get some good detailed information, but my question to you is are we working with the uh, citizen today and, the, and this uh, particular contractor? Are we, is the city doing anything right now to, or do we not believe there's something that needs to be rectified? If you can answer that, I'd greatly appreciate it. I, I'm not aware of us doing anything with the contractor or with the homeowner on this one. I do know that it, it was, they were supposed to have a court hearing last week. And so I don't know the status of it. You know, typically we like to stay out of those sorts of things, but um, as far as, at. okay. Additionally, um, the board uh, on these licenses, is there something pending as far as a revocation on the license? Is that something the citizen needs to bring forth and then needs to be heard by the appeals board? What, what's the process there? Is anything happening there? Uh, staff could uh, revoke a license for certain things. Uh, I suppose the board could too, if you took them to the, the building board. I suppose they could do that. Um, nothing's been done about that. Um, we haven't taken any action against the contractor 
like I said, until one of the things that you can pull a license for is not doing work without a permit. Until just 10 minutes ago, I didn't know that the, the allegation is, is that they didn't get a permit for it. Um, I don't have any information to support that. Do we have any information um, prior to this particular case, Brad, or this particular citizen, as far as um, issues with professionalism from uh, inspection staff? Well, one of the reasons we sent two inspectors out there was to have an eyewitness. Um, I've spoke with both of the inspectors. They said they were very polite. Uh, they gave the appropriate information. I'm not, I don't know that any, I wasn't there. I don't know what was said. We didn't tape the recording, They're, you know, record the conversations. Um, so. Okay. All right, very good. I appreciate it, Brad, very much. And I just wanted to, I just want to just encapsulate again, hopefully what we get out of this is that, uh, and not for you, Brad, just in general, that I'm hoping that we get some information here. Like I said, based on my own experience and then hearing some of the things that um, I experienced myself from this citizen, I'm very interested in seeing what comes back with information from the attorney's office or the appropriate office um, so that we can get some details because ultimately I'm concerned that we have these ordinances and staff brings them forward and the council agrees we approve them and we all understand that these processes are here to protect citizens um, ultimately and uh, I'm concerned that um, either because of the, the workload um, that we're creating workarounds uh, to some of the things in the ordinance. Um, maybe we're not, but I'm, I'm hoping when we get that information, we can address the issues and, and move forward so that consumers are better protected. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Graham, I see the attorney spoke with you, and is that um, one month, 30 days? Yes. Okay, with you? Okay, thank you for letting us thank know you. about this. Um, assumption. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I understand Mr. Wright's comments correctly, there are two issues at hand. One is the, the staff issue, and one is the liability issue, if any exists. Perhaps I can recommend that a claim be filed down in Keith's office. He is the one that would put it through the insurance process so that experts can look at, at the liability side of it, not the personnel side of it. Um, if there truly is going to be a claim against the city. That would be up to the citizen, right? Yeah. Ms. Graham, okay, Char Charity Doyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of questions from Mrs. Graham, if I may. Yes, yes. okay. Um, I know I, I saw that you had a folder with you, um, and I guess actually the question might go to, oh, are you holding it? <laughs> yes, I've given, them a, I've given them a complete copy of it. Okay, I was just going to ask if there was anything you wanted to give us, but you've already taken care of that. Um, my, my question for you, Mrs. Graham, is what, what did you hope to accomplish by bringing this to the city's attention? And I'm very grateful that you have. But what is it that you're looking for? And that might play a part in our finance officer's recommendation. I think there needs to be stricter regulations on how these contractors can get away with what they do. For example, putting a lien on a homeowner when the work hasn't been completed um, properly in the first place. But also having the city inspectors, the way they come out and speak to the homeowners and the way that they actually inspect the properties they this has to stop there has to be stronger regulations against that they should not go to the contractor and discuss a private conversation that they had with with the homeowner that you know resulted in something that did happen and i just feel that i'm hoping the city can tighten their regulations on these contractors to make sure that this does not happen to anyone else okay did you understand the finance officer's um, suggestion? I didn't, sorry, I was speaking okay. to the city attorney. What she said is if at any point you intended to hold the city liable for some of this, then we would put you in contact with our um, risk manager, Keith Lesperance, to start pursuing that avenue. What I'm hearing is that was not what your intent was. It was simply to bring this to our attention, make sure that since it's happened to you multiple times, it's not happening to other people and that we do what we need to do to tighten things up. Right. Okay, thank you. 
Could I, can I also say something else? Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to, but with um, regards to Brad Salon not being aware of the permit, I personally spoke to Mr. Salon and told him that the contractor had put a lien on me and that he did not have a permit when he actually carried out the work because I have the completion certificate showing that this was not actually applied for before the work was commenced. Do you have a documentation? I for do. That phone call. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Wright. I'm going to speak to you as a citizen and an elected representative of the citizens of Rapid City. The attorney, excuse me, finance officer advised you, and you didn't hear it, that if you feel that you have or a potential claim against the city of Rapid City, that's necessary that you file a claim with our finance office. That's your decision. Uh, just a minute. Well, you, the claim is filed at finance office, correct? Okay, Keith handles it. I stand corrected. Please be sure that you're advised of that right and privilege. If you bypass it, it's gone. You can exercise it. You can withdraw it at any time, but something to consider. Okay, thank you, and I will consider it. Okay, thank you. And he's located right down the stairs. Okay. Oh, he's not in today. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, do we have a motion on this? Yes, we do. It is to bring this back in a month. Right. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion passes. Okay, let's see, Mr. Wright, uh, number 20, request mayor to provide a report on existing developers agreement and all amendments regarding President Plaza and the obligations incurred by such by the city of Rapid City. I make a motion to go to Monday night's meeting without recommendation for full discussion. Okay, do we have a second? Okay, we have a second, the Doyle, uh, Joel. I would support the motion. I was just going to let you know I have a summary prepared. I'm going to email that out to you this afternoon with a additional email, some additional items, but then the summary will be linked to the agenda for Monday night. So. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Laurenti. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to make sure, I think I just you just led into that a little bit, but my questions on this were report, what does it need? What are you specifically asking for that way? Okay, that's what I was hoping was that there was some communication there. Yeah, so it's, it's happened, thank you. Yeah, and I will say that just to give you, and this will be in the email, but um, what I did in the report was outline what the current agreements, what the obligations of the respective parties are, um, kind of a brief history what each agreement did, and then also a summary of what I believe still needs to be done prior to construction beginning on this project. And so Jerry, is that what we were looking for? All right, very good. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. On number 21, introduction and first reading of, oh, I guess we didn't vote on that, did we? Me too. Uh, those in favor of sending this forward to Monday night without recommendation, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Okay, motion passed. Uh, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 5988 to prohibit certain use of handheld electronic wireless communication devices while driving in the city of Rapid City by adding section 10.12.410 to the Rapid City Municipal Code. Okay, we have a motion by Wright and a second by Laurenti. Uh, Ms. Doyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for Chief Allender, if I may. Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, just driving my son to school yesterday and there was a young man I was watching in the oncoming lane. He probably did not look up for a full eight seconds down doing something and it, I mean, it, it's not a, not a good situation. So my question for you is you know, we heard a lot of the banter and the back and forth and the total um, revamping of the, the, the legislation that just went through this last session and peer. And uh, I just want to make sure that I understand this one. Does allow for enforcement as a primary offense, is that correct? 
That's correct. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, those in favor say aye. Aye. Say uh, opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Two, acknowledge um, fiscal year 2013 annual financial report. Move to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. Second. A motion by Laurenti, a second by Wright. Any discussion? Okay, those in favor? Those opposed, same sign. Oh, Ms. Pauline. Thank you, Madam Chair. I forgot that we didn't have agenda review. Uh, I actually need this taken to council without recommendation. There is nothing attached to this agenda, so uh, we would like to have that extra time to prepare it for you. Okay, so those in favor of moving this to Monday night without recommendation, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. And motion passes. Okay, number 23. Update on Roosevelt 50 meter pool and Horace Mann leisure pool and request for additional funding for Horace Mann pool vision fund project. I was having so much fun until I got to that last line. Um, are there any motions at this point? Uh, Mr. Laurenti? Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I could, I'd like to ask the finance officer a question here. Pauline, the additional funding part, have we looked at that? Do we know where we're at? Are we still kind of just beginning to look at that? We actually have looked at that. There is an attachment linked to the agenda summary. It's called the Rapid State Cash Flow Analysis. After I looked at the 2013 actuals, it appears that we have about $1.5 million of undesignated cash that we could allocate to the project in 2014 without affecting any other projects doesn't affect reserve no it would still leave a million dollars in the reserve that we typically carry in the vision fund but again it'd be about 1.5 million that we could use in undesignated cash okay so you're saying the undesignated is purely just in the vision fund correct very good thank you okay uh, mr. Beagler did you want to update us on something before I are you just standing by? I would questions? be happy to update you um, on this uh, snowy April day. <clears throat> I thought maybe I'd brief you on a topic that's probably on everyone's mind, and that's uh, outdoor swimming opportunities. <laughs> uh, we have these two vision fund projects, the Roosevelt 50 meter pool and the Horace Mann pool that are both uh, approved vision fund projects. And uh, the uh, I, I thought I'd give you a little update on them. The 50 meter pool at Roosevelt we have week, uh, bi-weekly meetings that are held uh, to uh, provide progress uh, reports. Uh, those meetings are staffed by uh, city engineering staff, city parks and rec staff, uh, members of Fennel uh, Designs, as well as Acapulco Pools and Gustafson Builders. And as of the meeting this morning, that project is still on time and on budget. Uh, there is a one caveat to that, and that is with the, the recent snow that we had today, they have uh, almost exhausted all of their cushion in their scheduling for poor weather days. So if we continue to have more and more of this type of weather, that could affect the opening date. But as of now, it's still scheduled to open on or about the 1st of June. That's uh, great news. Uh, the Horace Mann Pool, uh, the design for that is complete, and that's including all of the, the pool, the pool house building, uh, the other related infrastructure, uh, uh, parking lots, uh, um, stormwater mitigation measures, landscaping, all of that is complete. And uh, the uh, reason for this request, obviously, is because with the, the more uh, developed design, uh, we're also able to come up with a more comprehensive cost estimate for the construction of this pool. Uh, the original estimates uh, at uh, the time that this was approved as a vision fund project were based on concept designs. And so therefore, the, the more refined numbers that are reflected in the attachment are the $6.66 million for construction. Uh, we feel that this is a, a, a very important project and uh, one that's been anticipated uh, and expected by you know, the community in general and by the residents of North Rapid specifically. Um, and we think that this is, is really a, a great uh, uh, project that uh, has been uh, 
uh, something that's been in the works for a, a long time. And this feasibility study that was conducted in 2012 really put down on paper what had been recognized by Parks and Recreation Department, uh, community leaders, and uh, North Rapid residents for a long time, that there was a, a need for improved aquatic facilities in North Rapid. And the 50-meter uh, pool is part of that. That's nearly complete. And uh, so we are therefore asking for your support and approval of this request for the reallocation of $1.5 million from undesignated cash uh, to the Horace Mann Pool Project to be available for fiscal year 2014. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wright. I make a motion we approve the adjustment of funding from the Vision Fund. Okay, Ms. Doyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for Mr. Bigler, if I may. Sure. Okay, I know that um, this council didn't approve the Horace Mann Pool project, but we had seen some uh, documentation on the, the level to which the city subsidizes that pool. Do you have any reason to believe that with construction of the new pool it's going to be more widely used and therefore um, you know, closer in line to self-sufficient than what we currently have up there? Well, it will be, it will be much uh, more fiscally uh, uh, sustainable, I guess, and efficient than what we had up there, that's for sure. Uh, there will still be a subsidy that we have at all of our pools, and this will not be any different. But the uh, feasibility study did look at the demographics of that area and did feel that there were uh, sufficient numbers of, of uh, uh, young adults and children that would really make this uh, pool uh, really a necessity for that area, and that there would be probably um, either like use or even uh, greater use of this facility than some of the other pools. Okay, and is that something that we'll continue to monitor just so we can know we that for another? We monitor that every year. Years from yes. now, and we need to consider an, another pool or a new pool? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, those in, any other discussion? Thank you, Mr. Bigler. Um, those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. I would just like to make a comment in case people are concerned that Chad Lewis is not with us in, uh, here, is he had another appointment that uh, since council went long today. So, but he's fine. Please. So, do we need a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, Renty moved and Doyle seconded. Those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. I have a 16-page dissertation I wanted to read. Don't run off. <laughs> <laughs>